So just, just to put that out there. Uh, as far as gold and gold rolling over, and you know, it's it's so f funny and human and typical that gold bugs, you know, they're only happy if gold's going up. If you know, next all time high, even if it's just a nominal one, oh yeah, everything's great. Oh, gold is corrected to 2,700. Whatever shall we do? You know, <laughs> are you kidding me? 27. I mean, a year ago it was like a thousand bucks less. Where are the bears? Where are the bond vigilantes out there? And not just Tinfoil Hat Lobo and his gold bug extremism, but even just on the mainstream, the U.S. labor market is key because that is the pillar that, you know, laborer slash consumer is the pillar that the uh, story or the narrative of American exceptionalism has been resting on. So for it to come out, you know, as bad as it was and, and you know, the the hurricanes didn't make a quarter of a million jobs disappear at once. Hello and welcome back to Soar Financially, a channel where we discuss the macro to help us understand the micro. My name is Kai Hoff and I'm the Ed JR Mining Guy over on X and of course your host of this channel. And I'm looking forward to welcoming a regular guest uh, on, on Soar Financially, it's Lobo Tiger. He is the independent speculator. Somebody we get rave reviews and somebody I really enjoy personally chatting with. So I'm really looking forward to catching up with him. We're recording this on Friday night, so we can see this or regard this conversation as a bit of a weekly or a, we, a, a market wrap up by the end of the week. I have to admit, thank God it's Friday. Um, it's been a long week for me. Lots of news, uh, exhausting travel, but... Uh, can't wait to have a glass of wine after this, Lobo, I have to admit. Um, before I switch over to, to my guest, please hit that like and subscribe button. It is a free way to support us, and we tremendously appreciate it. Now, Lobo, it is great to see you again. Thanks for making the time on a Friday afternoon. Thank you so much. It's always a fun conversation, Kai. Usually is. Usually is, and uh, I appreciate it. So l l let's dive right in. Lots to catch up on, lots of events this week. Uh, my head is still spinning, I have to admit. Um, Let's start talking maybe economic indicators first. Let's, let's set the scene a little bit. Like we, we've talked about five, six weeks ago last, um, we've gotten some drops report in between uh, US job openings keep dropping. So I'm just curious, like we've always talked about that the team soft landing sort of out of the door and team hard landing is knocking and maybe he's got a foot in the door already. Um, are you seeing some indicators that would sort of uh, underline that hard landing scenario now? It's interesting that you even frame it that way. I've just been listening as I always do. Uh, I take anti-nausea pills and then I listen to the mainstream news to see what, you know, everybody's saying about the latest developments in the mainstream financial media. And, you know, the the parade of soft landing or even no landing people out there, it's nonstop. And, and the arrogance, complacency, I'm not sure what the right word is, but, you know, the echo chamber when you're in the majority, it must be harder to detect than when you're in some minority. Like if you have some extreme view and everybody's agreeing with you, it might be easier to detect the echo chamber. But it's just amazing how many of them are saying, well, it's just getting harder and harder to see any bare case out there. You know, everything is coming up roses. And well, except maybe the labor market. Yeah, we have seen increasing signs of stress in the labor market. Like that's not important. <laughs> <laughs> or... Um, you know, layoffs starting to pick up and, you know, every time you see some chain file for bankruptcy, like TGI Fridays, they go, oh, well, you know, sit down dining. That's another casualty of the COVID lockdown. Well, but okay, but it's not like all sit down dining has gone away. Uh, so there's something more to it than that. Uh, and maybe the most uh, stunning to me, not, not that the excuse was made, but that it seemed to be swallowed hook, line, and sinker was the dismissal of the latest jobs report, which was basically zero. I mean, 12,000 jobs in an economy the size of the United States is basically nothing. You know? <laughs> um, and leading up to this, there was this just parade, nonstop parade of so-called experts down there telling us how it's all because of the weather, the hurricanes, and it wouldn't mean anything. And so lo and behold, we get you know, a basically disastrous jobs report. And everybody's like, oh, it doesn't mean anything. It's just the weather. And, <laughs> you know, th that th that the powers that be would spin it that way is not surprising. But that supposedly serious financial professionals on Wall Street would all say, yeah, okay, that makes sense. That's sort of gobsmacking. You know, where, where are the bears? Where are the bond vigilantes out there? 
and not just tinfoil hat Lobo and his gold bug extremism, but even just on the mainstream. And fortunately, we are starting to see some bond pushback, which is interesting if the bond vigilantes are starting to wake up. But just to put that last issue to rest, there's many indicators you want to go to. But the labor market is the U.S. labor market. My, my outlook is global, but the U.S. labor market is key because that is the pillar that, you know, laborer slash consumer is the pillar that the a story or the narrative of American exceptionalism has been resting on. So for it to come out, you know, as bad as it was, and, and you know, the, the hurricanes didn't make a quarter of a million jobs disappear at once. And if anything, there's an argument to be made for all the temporary jobs that that cleanup would have created. You know, wh where are those jobs? Why wasn't the broken window fallacy in full force this time? And not only that, it doesn't explain the 112,000 jobs that were just revised out of existence for the previous two months with no hurricanes. So, you know, the excuse makes no sense, or, or rather the excuse doesn't cover the magnitude of the data that we got. And the mainstream is just, you know, I'm not listening, I'm not listening. So, sorry, not to, not to rant too much, but that's, that's my big take. There's a lot of indicators out there. This is the most important one. Even if you're not an American, you, you'd love to see the America go up in flames because you're tired of the lies, whatever. As an investor, as a speculator, what happens to the United States dollar is profoundly impactful on all the commodities and metals that, and metals that I care about. So this one pillar of American exceptionalism, if it's showing cracks that are widening, that's a big deal. And push is coming to shove right now as you and I speak. Like briefly, like in preparation of our conversation, I looked at the U.S. job openings that came up this week as well, and I'm, I'm looking at the chart, and it, it still looks kind of healthy. But I, I'd be getting no, nervous. No, it doesn't. Like, no, that's no, what like, everybody says. Like oh, healthy. look, it's, it's like, elevated. But like, look at sorry, the let me, trend. Let me, let me yeah. sorry, paraphrase here. Like, <laughs> it looks like we're coming back to a level that we've been pre-COVID. Right. I would be worried about if we were to drop below seven million, or where roughly, like, let me. I'm not again, not an analyst, but if I were, to, if we were to drop down, yeah, no, no, I, I get that, it. I get it. Like that just, makes sense. But right? this is classic. This is this is just like people saying, "Well, all employment at four point one percent. That's great. That's historically great." But the point is the trend, you know, it's not just yeah. like we're happy to be at 4.1%, it's ramping up. And yeah. no, the latest sideways jog does not change that trend. And by the way, if labor force participation hadn't fallen, unemployment would have gone up again in this last report. So it's just not true that everything is fine. And, and also, by the way, the U3 unemployment that everybody's saying is, is by historical standards is low. Well, that's not historical standards. That's the current unemployment number after they, you know, bugger the numbers and changed them in the 1980s. The U6 number is more like the old unemployment number. So if you're going to say this is the lowest number 50 years, you need to look at the U6, which is over 7% unemployment. So no, you know, it's just not true that we're at this historically number. But to your chart right now, what you're saying, Yes, that over seven number, that's high on, you know, on a historical basis for that chart. But look at the trend. It's screaming downwards. And it doesn't just stop when it hits a historical average. Like what force is going to stop that uh, trend from going downwards? Well, you could say maybe Trump and all the trillions of dollars he wants to spend and the tax cuts he wants to put in. And OK, may maybe that happens, Kai. Uh, but if it does, if we're going to, you know, give, you know, waiters and waitresses no taxes on tips and everybody else no taxes on overtime and no taxes here, no taxes there, and we're going to spend a bunch more, there will be a price to be paid for that. And the most obvious one and of relevance to our investors, social consequences aside, moral hazard aside, the formula for the agenda right now is highly inflationary. And we all know where that goes. Now, I want to talk with you about, uh, you know, the ramifications of potential Trump policies here moving forward in, in, a, in a second. Um, quickly, like a good segue, like unemployment is one of the mandates the Fed has. Inflation is the other. And I mentioned briefly to you before hitting the record button. Some, there's something I keep getting stuck on. It's something Powell said. Um, we're trying to control inflation. We want to get back to 2%. But then he says, well, we're at 2.1%. And he still cuts. It feels like he's overdoing something. It feels like he was backed in a corner. I cannot make sense of it. 
that 2.1%, 2%, like potato, potato, in my opinion. Um, like, wh why? Yeah. Like, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of this. Yes. Like, it okay. feels like we're overdoing something. I'm, I cannot put a finger on the term I should use for this, right? But uh, well, it doesn't I'll, make I'll sense I'll see if I me. can help. <laughs> um, but to, to substantiate your concern, and this is just like the other charts we've been talking about, the unemployment's going like this. That's the concern. The number that it happens to be at right now is less important than the direction that it's going, which is higher, right? And the job creation, the number that it happens to be now that that's not concerning is not the point. It's the screaming deceleration of job creation. That's the point. So with this thing, as you're talking about, if if in, from the mainstream perspective for which Powell speaks, if inflation is a sign of economic growth, then throttling inflation means throttling the economy. And so it is a scary thing if the trend is coming down and we're within kissing distance of 2% the target and we're not even talking about, you know, lightening up on the brakes, you know, what's, what would you, what would cause you to think that it's just going to hit your target and stop there? It's not, this is a Jeff Gunlack thing too, by the way, it's likely to overshoot. If you, if you throttle the economy so hard, that inflation comes screaming down and you're still throttling it. Why would you think it's going to stop at your target? That's insane. So were they painted into a corner? Were they backed into a corner? So there, there may have been some of that there. Uh, you know, we had FOMC um, day you know, just on the heels of the election. And if they didn't do what they guided they would do, then it would be very easy for everybody, not just Trump, to say, oh, that was political. Like, oh, they, they wanted to ease up while Biden was in office. And now that Trump's coming in, then, oh, we're going to slam on the brakes. It could seem like an anti-Trump move and that would undermine their independence or whatever. So you could you could look at things like that. But um, I think that there's more to it than that. I, I don't think that Powell is stupid. And I don't think that he's unaware of the kinds of things that you and I are talking about. I think he thinks that he's the one of the captains of the ship of state and he's got to steer it into a safe harbor. And that does not mean telling the truth. And, you know, he's got to say whatever he's got to say to, to keep people from panic, to maintain confidence, because after all, confidence is what makes the economy go, right? And, and to get us safely into that, that port. So I think that they do see more of the trouble that you and I have just been discussing. I think that they're well aware of the cracks in that one pyramid, uh, sorry, pillar of American exceptionalism, that that labor or consumer. And so I, I think that while the, the overall narrative of continuing to cut, while it looks like we're almost there at the goal and everybody keeps talking about how wonderful the economy is, so why are we, you know, why are we doing this? Well, I, I think that they realize that there's more risk there. And so I think they're addressing that. I, I, if, if they really thought um, that inflation was licked, and if anything, you know, every, everything was fine, there's no need to change, then, you know, maybe they wouldn't have. But I, I do think there's concern there. And that's part of what the policy is, is responding to. It's not what they say, it's what they do. And what they did says, you know, inflation is not licked. And, but it wasn't a jumbo or anything like that. So they're still concerned. I, I see this balance there. And sorry, one more thing. Um, you know, you said it's almost a two, it's 2.1 or whatever. But remember, Powell has long insisted that the PCE, not the CPI, is the main number they look at, and the so-called core PCE is what they're really targeting. And I'm not sure, you know, what the official mandate may be. I mean, it's not actually written in the law what their target metric should be. I mean, the, the, the law doesn't say the Fed shall meet X percent of CPI, X to be defined by Congress or something like that. That's not what it says. They have this dual mandate, full employment and stable prices. It doesn't say CPI, PCE or whatever number you want to invent in there. So it's up to them to decide what their goalpost is. And the goalpost they've made the most noise about is core PCE, which is not coming down. It's stuck just under 3%. It's gone flat for the last three prints, 2.7. Okay, it was 2.65, whatever this time. But basically it's going sideways for a month after month. So if I'm the Fed and you know I'm looking at the, the number that I've said is the most important and it's sticky, 
then no, I can't say, oh, job done. You know, let's let's uh, stop cutting. We're 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 at the what do they call it? R star. We're 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 right now. We're sufficiently. Re- it's you know Goldilocks. It's not too hot, not too cold. It's just right. Doesn't feel like it. I have to admit, Doesn't Goldilocks. Like, like maybe we're in that uh, the eye of the hurricane. How about that? It feels like the eye of the hurricane. No, no, that it brings back shades yeah. of Doug Casey. But, <laughs> but but again, I mean, just just think about it. If they have said this is their target. You know, and okay, are, you know, are his lips moving. Maybe he's lying. I don't know. But but this is for whatever it's worth what they've said, and it's still, uh, what is it, forty percent above target. That's yeah. significant. I have one last statement that Powell made yesterday that I want to quickly like bounce off of you and see what your thoughts are. Because Powell reiterated that while inflation is on a downward path, like real wage gains are needed for Americans to feel financial relief. I kind of understand the statement, what he's saying. But talking about inflation, if we see more wage gains, doesn't that push inflation higher again? Doesn't that right. uh, really yeah. threaten his his mandate again? Like, Well, and it's interesting because I'm not a believer in the dreaded wage price spiral. I mean, yes, you see that dynamic, but that's not that's not the root cause. I, I, to give credit where due, Peter Schiff does a great job of explaining this. And he says that properly understood, the wage price spiral is the price price spiral. Like wages are just a price, in, you know, a price of labor in the market. And the real root cause is, of course, real inflation, i.e. monetary inflation. And an aspect of this is, you know, prices, consumer prices go up, you know, consumers demand higher wages, right? And then the, the, manu- the employers have to raise their prices. And, and so, yes, there is this kind of cyclical spiral activity, but it doesn't self-cause itself. And it's not confidence that makes it go up. It's monetary inflation. And guess what? You know, M2 is going up again. So, <laughs> um, you know, th- there is an issue there. And I suspect that Powell knows it. But, um, you know, he, he it's interesting that he really almost as, as vehemently as he said, no, he wouldn't quit if, if Trump asked him to step down. He just as vehemently said, no, we can't declare victory on inflation yet. So I think this fits with everything we're, ta- we're, we're talking about. The ball he has his eye on, at least according to what he said, is core PCE. It's not there yet. It's sticky. And there's signs of trouble in the economy. So he's trying to balance not having beaten inflation yet, but being aware that all is not as well in Mudville as, as everybody would like to proclaim. No. Like the last press conference, I've read a bit of a summary, and uh, I have to admit, Chad GPT helped me out summarize it a little bit. But the first time I'm reading is that uh, Jerome Powell is looking out for external factors, meaning uh, Powell acknowledged global geopolitical risks, high government deficits, and fiscal policies globally that are being uh, influencing his uh, his his policies, which I've found interesting. Like I haven't read something like that previously. Because and we, I think we might have discussed that as well. Like, what does the situation in the Middle East do with U.S. like fiscal and monetary policy? For yeah, example? Cl- classic misdirection. You know, uh, back in the day, after he was no longer the maestro in there, Greenspan said that he would quote engage in some form of syntax destruction, which sounded as though I were answering the question, but in fact had not. This is the Fed speak playbook, and I think that's exactly what Powell was doing. Okay, perfect. Then uh, let's put that aside. Um, I have two directions I can take our conversation now. You mentioned the bond vigilantes on one side, and I do want to talk about, of course, the outcome of the U.S. elections and general impact. Um, Let's start with the U.S. election result, because the Fed is is one of the topics uh, Trump has mentioned in the past, and his allies are kind of keen to maybe get a bit more oversight of what the Fed is doing. And he thinks, or like statements have been made that the president should have maybe a say in uh, in the interest rate debates. Um, w- what are your thoughts on that? And do you, do you see that even happening, given that we've almost seen like a red sweep here in the House and Senate, although I think the House is not decided yet? Yeah, they'd have to change the law to be able to uh, give the executive more authority on that. Even with a red sweep, that seems pretty tough. That's a tough pill to swallow. I don't think the average American, to the degree they even understand what the Fed is or does at all, I don't think anybody that that has any clue would think that it's a good idea to give the executive more power over the Fed. Like, why even have the Fed then? Why not just have the president set interest rates? 
<laughs> or do whatever other meddling the Fed does. Uh, now, I'm I'm not saying that I think the Fed is as independent as they say, and I'm not you know I'm not a Fed fan. Creature from Jekyll Island, I get it. I'm not trying to defend the Fed or say that it's great or that it's done a great job. I I, I see it much as a criminal enterprise, and I think it should be abolished. But I'm not America, or rather, I'm a tiny, 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 tiny slice of a subculture of a subculture within America. So I just, I just see this as a really tough, uh, a tough ho uh, road to hoe. I, I don't see it happening. I don't think it's likely. Trump can bluster and so on. Um, and you know, even if if I thought that Trump would do a better job directing Fed policy than Powell, giving Trump the power to do that means giving the next. Democrat or whoever gets elected in the future, that same power in the future. And it would take an exceptionally short-sighted group of politicians to put something like that through. Um, so I, I, I just, I think that's more noise. There's more interesting things to, to think about, like, you know, what, what role will Elon Musk have in this administration, you know, clearly he's not going to step down from SpaceX and Tesla and so on. So I don't think he's going to become a government employee all of a sudden. But as a person who has has Trump's ear, what influence can he? he will? I think this is a a much more not just interesting and fun, but I, but a potentially impactful issue than than this sideshow with the Fed. You know, at the end of the day, Powell's term is up in twenty six. If Trump has to deal with him during that time. He can still work on on any number of other campaign promises that he's made with a red sweep. Um, so let's see what that let's see what happens. Let's see if we get the red sweep. We have just a couple seats left in the House that you know they're that close. If they get that, let's see if what actually happens. And and sorry, as the official rain on the parade, you know me. That's my claim to fame. <laughs> as a due diligence guy, I have to remind people that. You know, Trump started out with both houses of Congress last time and got very, very little done. I mean, ultimately, the tax cuts did happen, but that was a, a bipartisan push later. Um, you know, he, he made very, very little progress when he actually had that that majority in both houses. And I hope he'll do better this time from a free market perspective, from a liberty perspective. Some of the items on his agenda would be a step in the right direction. So. I, I'm hopeful, but I remember what happened last time, you know, so just uh, I, I, I would advise everybody to remember that, you know, politics, it always disappoints. <laughs> I think that's something everybody can agree on. I think that's throughout history. Like, I, I think I might have mentioned that before. I love listening to 50s and 60s, like BBC radio plays from back in the day, like crime plays. And it's always about unemployment, terrible politics, and it's like every, everything's getting more expensive. That's uh, you, it's always the same topics. Like even back in the fifties and sixties, that was the top main, main topic of discussion. Well, but um, my, come... my mentor, Doug Casey likes to quote uh, old Roman writers who would complain about the dissipation of the youth. They didn't understand traditional, you know, family values. We would say today, you know, they were slothful. They didn't work hard. I mean, it just sounds like every generation for the last 2000 years, it's so human to have that same perspective. Um, anyway, yeah. sorry. I was just telling my kids what not to watch on TV because I don't <laughs> agree with it. It's exactly exactly what you've mentioned. You know like, that you just made a list that they're going to go out and watch. Probably. Yeah, exactly. I, I told them what not to watch, and that's what they're doing upstairs right now while we're recording here. So, um, no, um, but l let's take it from the commodity perspective, uh, Lobo. Like, what, what kind of policies are you maybe excited about to see that he could push through? Or what, where do you see some pos uh, possible changes happen? Well, as a, from a commodities perspective, people hated this when I said this, but you know, a Harris victory might have been better for my investment portfolio. Doesn't mean I would have voted for her. I'm a Puerto Rican. I can't vote for either of them anyway. But even if I had not been, I certainly would not have voted for, for Harris. I'm, I'm just saying that um, of the two of them, Biden was much more pro-nuclear than Trump. He actually directed billions towards it more than Trump. Uh, and talked about advanced nuclear being part of the solution for the agenda, whereas Trump has dragged his feet. And in his, I know that Elon has his ear now, and Elon is fiercely pro-nuclear, so maybe things will look up. But Trump did say in his Rogan interview not so long ago that nuclear was dangerous. I mean, he in his head, it seems like nuclear weapons, nuclear power, it's all part of the same thing. 
you know, civil electricity generation is not distinguished clearly in his thinking. So, you know, I'm not sure that that Trump is the best for my uranium stock portfolio. He's talked about rescinding the Inflation Reduction Act spending. It, you know, as Orwellian as that name is, it did allocate you know hundreds of billions of dollars that could go into so-called critical minerals, including copper, lithium, whatever. Uh, if we see that rolled back, the people who you know uh, call it the green scam and are, and are opposed to the government ramming this agenda down everybody's throats, they have something to cheer there. On the but as a commodities speculator, you know this has an impact on my portfolio. On the other hand, the overall Trump agenda is inflationary. That is actually by you know by definition almost by its nature is bullish for anything real, including all commodities, uh, but especially monetary metals. Um, so my, my main takeaways here are not new to you, Kai, and probably your audience. So I'll just briefly say, I still think that the hard landing that we're in is likely to become evident like next month. <laughs> like we're, when I said the rubber hits the road, we're at that point where push comes to shove. That's what I mean you know, what happens in the next U.S. labor report will, will do a lot to either validate or invalidate my thesis for, for the short term. So if I'm right, you know, the Trump agenda is inflationary, but we're going to have some pain first. And that's bearish for oil, copper, any industrial minerals. Um, but then afterwards, you know, the money helicopters go out in force and it's inflationary and bullish, basically everything real. It's all commodities. Uh, that same scenario creates safe haven demand. So gold and silver as monetary metals, it's bullish for them, even if everything else is going down. If I'm wrong and, you know, Trump, sorry, Powell really did manage the soft landing and it's, you know, onward and upward to the next reflationary boom from here then it's still bullish for gold and silver as monetary metals because that's an inflationary environment. But it's also bullish for copper and oil and other industrial minerals now. So I don't know what's going to happen. I'm not claiming to know the future. I'm telling the audience, frankly, I think we're going to see more pain and lower prices in industrial minerals before they go up. Um, but either way, they go up eventually. So, so the choice for the audience, if you think I'm right, is to hold off on industrial minerals for a sale that's coming up and then go long. Uh, but either way, it's bullish for monetary metals now. And if I'm wrong, then you want to start doing bargain hunting. We're, we're approaching tax law season, Kai. So this is a great time. If you're looking to deploy capital now, you know, on the Lobos right, you know, gold, silver, and uranium, or Lobos wrong, everything, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, either way, this tax law season could be a source of opportunities for you. Oh, 100 percent. And uh, we'll, we'll debate that in a second. When we talk about sentiment about, uh, amongst the mining stocks and where, where things are headed. Um, just just on the macro side, like I, I quickly need to talk about the bond vigilantes that you brought up and uh, maybe the move in the bond market just over the last few weeks. Uh, I'm, I keep looking at the 10 year and uh, the, the yield keeps draw, uh, going higher, meaning the bonds are draw, uh, crashing. Uh, are going lower, of course. Um, I'm trying to understand what that what that really means. Like trying to put that a bit into perspective, especially like the day after the election, um, the bond yields completely like shot up by uh, almost 0.15 percent uh, basis points, which is fairly high for a bond move. Uh, gold dropped uh, yeah. as well. So can can you make a bit of sense of that? Like can well, you put okay, a I would, bit of perspective? I would actually that? I would actually pull out the election day. I mean that was that was pretty crazy. On, on multiple asset types across different markets. That was pretty crazy. I would just separate that out as noise. I, I would look at the trends before and after, you know, try to connect the gaps uh, because there was there was a lot of crazy and contradictory moves that day. And, and even intraday, huge swings up and down. Mr. Market changing is not classic. You know, Mr. Market is a psycho type behavior. So, you know, very hard to put a narrative on that. And, and much of it was reversed the next day. Like gold was down 80 bucks on election day. It was up 40 bucks the next day, or at least at one point it was. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, the, these things, anything that reverses that quickly, that doesn't, let me put that, let me rephrase. You know, 
there's a knee jerk reaction. And then this sort of reality sets in where people who've just gone by assumptions or haven't updated their algos start thinking about it and saying, well, wait a minute, you know, what does this really mean? And so I would encourage people to, to smooth that, those blips out. Um, the, the issue with the bond market, I'm not a bond king. You know, I'm, I'm not one of these guys that specialized in that. So the, the most responsible answer here is actually to punt and say, ask somebody else. But I, I, so I'm not going to tell you what it means, but I, I will just throw one more thought in there to try not to be completely useless. And that is when, when the bond market starts doing unexpected things, that itself is a signal. Like I'm, I'm not the, the bond whisperer to tell you exactly what that's likely to mean, but, but that's really interesting and important. And if it continues, then, you know, that raises specters of bond vigilantes a la, you know, trust. If, you know, it, I, I love tax cuts, you know, I, I hate paying taxes. That's why I voted with my feet and I'm legally paying fewer taxes because I live and create and produce here in Puerto Rico. Um, so I'm all for tax cuts, and I. Uh, but you know, if you're going to promise all kinds of tax cuts, and you're going to promise all kinds of spending and all kinds of benefits and all this other stuff, at some point that just doesn't work. And this is this is what happened in the UK with the guilt crisis. That trust moment was the bond market balking and saying, "Just this this budget doesn't work." Uh, so there is a risk in the United States of a trust moment. Now, okay. The U.S. has its reserve status for the dollar. It's different. I get that. I'm just saying <laughs> it's worth paying attention to the bond market. When when you see even, you know, the, the bond experts on Bloomberg or Yahoo Finance or the Wall Street Journal or whatever, scratching their heads and saying, you know, why is the bond market doing this? Uh, I think that is a red flag and it's worth paying close attention to. And if it's the beginning of bond margin vigilant bond vigilantes calling BS on an agenda, then that has big consequences. We'll, we'll try to get Ed Giordani back here on the on the program. We've had him on about a year ago or so. I'll, I'll need to check the date, but uh, he, he's the guy who- He's uh, a or the, smart the guy, yeah. I, I, would, I would listen to what he has to say. May not agree with it all, but I would definitely listen to him. Yeah, he, he's the person who coined the phrase bond vigilantes back in the 80s. So. He, he might know. <laughs> he might know. We'll, we'll, we'll get to him. Um, I think we covered the most basic, the, the biggest topics. Like, I think let, let, let's talk mining and uh, let's uh, commodities, it, maybe a bit more specifically here. Um, back, back when we last spoke about six, seven weeks ago, the central banks were still buying gold aggressively. Um, it seems like the price has topped off a little bit. Uh, we haven't really moved, like a bit of pressure on the price of uh, price of gold as, as we speak here. Uh, we're about to close the week below 2700, it looks like. Um, let, let's talk about momentum maybe in, in the gold price. Uh, have the buyers disappeared? Are they just taking a break? Are they waiting? What, what are your thoughts on the recent price developments here, Lobo? Sure. Um, one quick thought before we dive in there, maybe segue from the last bit. Uh, one pro-Trump thing I can say is that talking to people on the ground, you know, geologists working with you know, BLM people and for even forestry service people and so on. The last Trump administration did make a difference on the ground. I mean, the, the word came down from the top, from Washington and the bureaucrats, you know, even people who had been there for a long time who were obstructive, you know, that they, they still have to obey what their bosses tell them to do. And even despite things like the, you know, that huge pebble mine in Alaska not going forward under the last Trump administration. So I'm not saying that Trump is perfect and everything's going to be great, but this drill baby drill idea of his is consistent with how Trump uh, 1.0, as people like to say, uh, impacted the resource sector in the United States. So they're actually, from the mining perspective, you know, whatever, whatever the, the, you know, the, the fiscal uh, case may be from the regulatory's perspective for mining, uh, this could be a very good thing uh, for, for investors to keep in mind. Um, so just, just to put that out there, uh, as far as gold and gold rolling over and, you know, it's, it's so f funny and human and typical that gold bugs, you know, they're only happy if gold's going up, of course. If, you know, next, <laughs> All time high, even if it's just a nominal one. Oh, yeah, everything's great. Oh, gold is corrected to 2,700. Whatever shall we do? 
You know, are you <laughs> kidding me? 27. I mean, a year ago it was like a thousand bucks less, or a little bit more than that. But you know, this the think about it. If gold cratered right from 2800 to 300 bucks down to say 2500 if if gold retreated $300 that would be huge that would that would whack the the gold stocks in a big way there would be it would it would change people's decision making in a way that what we've seen so far and the fluctuations so far I haven't really done but 2500 would be a fantastic gold price for all but the most incompetent gold miners so <laughs> You, you know, the, the scenario, the setup here is one where you could see a perfectly healthy bull market have a perfectly normal and even healthy correction that doesn't change the overall story or trajectory at all, but creates a spectacular buying opportunity. This is not a prediction. I'm not saying that this is what's going to happen. You know, gold tends to lead inflation. And as we've just been discussing, the Trump agenda is highly inflationary. So... You know, it, I, I'm not surprised actually that we've had some correction and we're holding around 2,700. I'm not saying it can't go lower. I'm saying if it does, I would absolutely see that as a buying opportunity. I would not subscribe to the notion that 2,800 was a peak and the next five years is going to be down. I do not think that this year, you know, famous last words, but <laughs> I do not think that this year is going to be like 2011 all over again. If I did think that, I would have a very different thing to say to you, but I do not. I think if we get a big correction, I would absolutely, you know, I would, I would be as close to going all in as I ever get. I would seize that opportunity with both hands or all four paws, as the case may be for a Lobo. Um, as for why and what's going on and who and what, the central banks have pulled back that, you know, the BRICS sent, or the, the, the non G7 central banks that have been doing the buying, they have cooled off a bit. I think that's a rational response to higher prices, you know. Um, but they haven't stopped, right? They're, they're still, the net buying continues. So it's not true that central banks have stopped buying. At the same time, it is also true that Western investors are finally joining the parties. And we're seeing that in, in net inflows to the ETFs. The World Gold Council has reported uh, more institutions and high net worth individuals in the West buying. I don't know where they get that data from, but for what it's worth, you know, they're they're reporting that that's finally happening. And, uh, you know, th that's very bullish. And if people have heard you and me talk before, Kai, they may remember that I was bullish on gold this year because I thought we were going to see, you know, recession, which is usually good for gold. And, uh, you know, more rate cuts, which is usually good for gold and and high inflation, which should be good for gold. I, all these factors we're good for gold. And all those factors are just now starting to come into play. Really since last July, August, when the labor market starting to crack, that's when my thesis for this year started to play. But at that point, we're already at 2,500. And now that we're seeing them, I think, pick up speed. I think my outlook is actually more supported by the evidence now than it was a summer. Um, but we're going into that, you know, 2,700. So, <laughs> you know, we're looking at a bullish setup for gold and silver from much higher prices. So, you know, that's kind of exciting. Um, again, I, I want to make crystal clear to the audience. I'm not saying there can't be a correction. Uh, I'm saying that it's not a foregone conclusion. Like you remember, Kai, uh, you know, about a year ago, I was warning about uranium having pulled a hockey stick and we were likely to see a substantial correction, which lo and behold, we got. I got plenty of hate for that. But I'm not sounding that same alarm now. Like back then, you know, uranium got up so much, it was way above the incentive cost. It's not a monetary metal. It just seemed like it'd gone too far too fast and correction was the more likely scenario. I'm not saying that about gold or silver right now. I'm saying that it has gone up a lot. It has pulled a hockey stick. So if it corrects, no surprise. But there's so much going for gold right now, including the election, including the Fed continuing to cut, that, you know, I, I'm actually not betting on a correction. You know, I'm not selling anything. I'm not pulling back any of my bets. I'm not changing my portfolio because I think that a correction is the more likely result ahead. It is a possible one. I don't know. So my, my you know, what to do? 
I don't know what's going to happen. So what to do? Well, since I don't know what's going to happen, I'm not selling. I'm not changing my portfolio. I am building cash so that if we get that correction, I'm able to act on it. If we don't, I'm still long. So I benefit from it going up. That, that's what I'm doing right now with my own money. Just to add to that, Europeans two months in a row now are net sellers of ETFs, like gold ETFs. Puzzles me. Like gold, uh, gold.org, like the World Gold Council, keeps out, comes out once a month with their gold report. They came out yesterday. I just uh, pulled it up. And Europeans are still selling. Americans or North America is buying. Asia is buying. Uh, volumes increased. Asset under management increased. But us Europeans were selling. If uh, if there's a European watching, please let me know why. Um Put it in the comment below and well, to understand it. Um, I can't wondering... answer that with knowledge, but I would just put it out there. I mean, the trouble in Europe, I don't have to tell you in Germany <laughs> how bad it is. right? It, and if gold, if the reason to own gold is not as an investment or a speculation, but because it is money, it is savings, it's your rainy day fund. Well, maybe it's raining in Europe and people are yeah. dipping into it. That's the only explanation I could probably subscribe to. Uh, as of this point right now. Now, um, the silver, we have to quickly talk about same thesis, like don't worry about it. Yes, we broke down below 3250 again, which was a breakout level. Um, we're below that. Should we be concerned about what you just said? Oh, it broke below 3250. Are you kidding? I know. You know, it, these mines were built. Well, many of the, the, you know, the up and going, you know, they were built with like $15 silver in mind. So you have to be a pretty crappy miner if you're not making money at these price levels. So, you know, oh my gosh, we're correcting down. I mean, we've held above 30 for what, most of a year now? Or it's over half a year, I think. I mean, that's really significant. And, and by the way, this helps you in your due diligence. As a due diligence guy, right? You know, I love this sort of thing. You've got a couple quarters now of relatively high silver. And if your company is not making money in this environment, that's a red flag. You got to ask yourself, what's wrong with this company? You know, maybe they have a legacy mine that's not so efficient, but they're using the cash flow to build a new mine that's going to be great. Okay, you know, maybe something like that. But generally, if you've got a producer and it's not consistently making money right now and over the last couple quarters, that is a huge red flag. And you need to ask yourself, is this a stock I don't want to? And I would say the same thing for gold too. You know, gold even more so. If you've got a miner that can't make money at 2,700 gold or over the last quarter, you know, or, or, or really last couple quarters, plus, 20, plus or minus 2,500 plus, if you're not making money at this point, you know, you really need to ask yourself, am I in the right business? And if I own shares in that company, uh, you know, this, this is, uh, I, it's on me if I ignore these red flags. Is new one a red flag for you? That's actually an interesting question. And I typically don't talk about single stocks. Oh, sure. you know, yes. That's what people pay me for. But, but let's look at Newman as a sector indicator. And one of the things I've been looking for is as the gold dollar exchange rate goes up, you know, the miners should be having better margins. And that should begin to attract outside investors. Um, and so far, you know, the people who own the ones that have disappointed, they're, they're pretty unhappy. But I don't think it's accurate to say that the miners as a, as a group have all failed. Um, you know, some of the more troubled ones or some of the more complicated ones like Newmont or Barrick, you know, they, they haven't given us, you know, the kind of blowout um, margin improvement that we would have hoped for. But neither of those companies is famous for having the best margins. There are others that are more well known for that. And some of them are delivering in spades. So takeaways are one it's not true that all the miners are underperforming some are and that's made the average for the majors look a little lackluster but you know what it's partly due to expectations like the trouble with newmont going back to where you started with this question you know newmont still made a huge amount of cash i, I forget what it was but it was like was it like 900 million dollars like or something three x what it was over last year i mean comparing q3 to q3 2023 I don't remember the number, but it was like three or four. I mean, it was this huge increase. So I mean, how is that a disaster? Well, it wasn't as big as an increase as analysts had expected. So we, we got to take these things in stride. You got to, you know, look at the, you know, what's really going on here. And I think what's really going on here is that, yes, actually, we are seeing the mining industry improving. 
it's not perfect. Some are better than others. Some got warts. I get that. And that's part of what I'm saying. You know, if, if your stock, your, your producer is underperforming, that's a red flag. Pay attention to that, but don't throw out the whole sector, you know, that, you know, with that bathwater, the, and so that's the due diligence takeaway. But as far as the, the macro, I, I think we are seeing the gold miners, the gold industry benefit. It's doing better. And I think that's increasingly attractive to, you know, the, the generalist investor out there. You know, the, what's missing here, Kai, would be if we do get a big correction in mainstream investments, if, if the AI hype really simmers down, for example, and investors start saying, OK, OK, are you making more money with this AI or have you actually developed you know, a program using this AI? You talk about AI, you know, show me the money. If that starts happening and they can't show the money and, and we get a big correction and people start looking, OK, well, AI was yesterday. What's working now? If at that time what's working now is gold miners or gold and silver miners, it, it could be epic. Right. So I, I don't want to promise that. I don't want to bring out Doug Casey's old Hoover Dam going through a garden hose thing. I don't know. No. Um, but you know what? Even if none of that happened, like that's potential upside. Flavor the day of gold would be wonderful for my portfolio. But if it doesn't happen, simply by owning the better miners that are making money right now, you know, and increasing dividends right now, and having the better developers that are building what look like high margin mines in the making right now right and, and the explorers that are that have success they have success in progress they are hitting in drill result after drill result they're they're hitting right now like these guys overall are delivering and i can make money in the space even if gold remains whoa stuck at 2700 for all all next year you know that's a fantastic <laughs> purgatory to be stuck in yeah. if you've got to be stuck in one Hundred percent. No, no. I think let's end it here. Like, uh, let's end on a positive note here. Let's. Uh, uh, I think that's a perfect, uh, you know, end point to end. Like, we can still talk. We got so many topics we can still discuss. Lobo, like other commodities. Like, we haven't even touched uranium, for example. But we'll save that maybe for a bit of a twenty twenty five outlook later in December. We'll we'll have to get you back on and uh, let's, let's make some predictions for next year together. Um, Lobo, or over a beer at the Deutsche Goldmesse. Well, you're not coming out, are you? Well, not this time. <laughs> well, well, that's in May, the next one. So 2025 is almost done by then. So <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Markets are forward looking. All right. Uh, exactly. No, no, but uh, we'll have to get you back on to discuss a little bit what, uh, what the outlook could be for 2025. Uh, inauguration happening early January as well. So let's let's get our crystal balls out and uh, predict a little bit what, what, what might happen. Lobo, as always, like where can we find more of your work? As always, phenomenal commentary. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Independentspeculator.com. Uh, the the quick sales pitch is is sign up for the free weekly digest. Promise we won't spam you. Can't promise you'll like what I have to say, but I can promise that we won't spam you with a flood of daily advertisements. And I guess maybe one more quick thing is at this tax loss season, it's worth having a look at my take. We have almost a thousand companies under coverage. We take requests from clients. Don't claim to always get everything right, but I do claim to be unbiased. I work for my readers. And so if you're wondering what to buy or sell or hold this tax law season, it could be that my more affordable service called My Take could be just the thing for you. Perfect. That's the perfect teaser because that was one of the topics I was going to touch, but we were getting a bit long here. Um, so definitely follow Lobo. Go sign up for his newsletter and uh, you'll get a better understanding of what tax law season means and uh, how, how, how the miners and the explorers are going to handle it this year. Curious about Lobo's take here. Lobo, thank you so much. As always, really appreciate phenomenal market wrap up here for the week and uh, everybody else. Thank you so much for tuning in. Highly appreciate your comments and feedback. And of course, a free way to support us is by hitting that like and subscribe button. We tremendously appreciate that. Put some comments down below. Like what should we ask Lobo maybe for a, a year outlook for a 2025 outlook? Um, as as well something some topics you want to discuss and heard um let, let us know we do want we, we do read all the comments we'll include those in the next conversation so thank you so much for tuning in have a great weekend and uh, we'll be back with lots more.